Good afternoon, and welcome to Think Tech Asia. It's Tuesday, February 10th, 2015. I'm your host, Keith Bettinger. And a little later on in today's program, we'll be welcoming our guest, Dr. Yuren Dosh, Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Department of International Politics and Development Cooperation at the University of Rostock in Germany. Dr. Dosh is a noted scholar working on international relations in the Asia-Pacific realm, and he's currently a visiting scholar at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And so it's a real treat to have him here on the program today. Dr. Dosh and I will be discussing regional integration in Southeast Asia and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. Before we begin our discussion, though, we'll have our short news summary of ongoing issues around Asia. And just as a reminder, if you have any Asia-related events to publicize, please contact me at think Keith think Tech at gmail.com. That's KeithThinkTech at gmail.com. You can also send me comments uh, and questions directly via my Twitter at KCC Geography. So now on with our news summary. We've got an update on a story we've been following from the Philippines. Regular viewers will recall that two weeks ago there was a major firefight between police and separatists in the Philippines. The Philippine government stated that its forces were targeting terror suspect Zukilfi Bin Hir, also known as Marwan, who was wanted in connection to bombings around Southeast Asia. New reports indicate that DNA evidence pr proves that Marwan was indeed killed in the police raid, which also left dozens of officers dead. Marwan was one of the FBI's most wanted terror suspects and was believed to be a part of Jema Islamia, cent Jema Islamia's Central Command. Marwan allegedly specialized in bombs and explosive devices, including those triggered by cell phones. The U.S. government had placed a $5 million bounty on Marwan, and officials are working to confirm if two Moro Islamic, Front, uh, Islamic Liberation Front, MILF members, indeed tipped off authorities as to Marwan's location. In a Senate hearing in the Philippines, Police Director Getulio Nepanyas Jr., who lost his job over the raid, stated that Marwan and J.I. had plans to bomb the Pope's convoy as he visited the archipelago nation in January. The Philippines National Police Force is preparing for sympathy attacks in the wake of the killing of Marwan. In South Asia, we have some election news from the world's largest democracy, India. Vote counting is underway for the election of the Delhi State Assembly, which, according to analysts, is a key test for Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, Bharatiya Janata Party. The election is taking place because the main, op main parties were unable to form a coalition government for a year. On Saturday, an estimated 67% of the 13 million eligible voters showed up at the polls. Early, indication, early indications are that former policewoman Kiran Bedi, the chief minister pick of Modi's BJP party, is lagging behind the Aam Admi party's Arvind Kejriwal. Kejriwal is known as an anti-corruption activist, uh, had been elected last year but resigned after an anti-corruption bill failed to pass. Prime Minister Modi took office as prime minister last year and has been very popular locally and internationally. His party has won a number of key elections and has defeated the AAP in many constituencies, and Modi has worked to increase international investment in India. AAP's strength is said to be among working class and poor voters, which comprise about 60% of Delhi's voters. One of the key issues in the election is public safety, as there's been a 99% increase in crimes reported in Delhi since 2013, with solved cases hovering around 30% particularly disturbing to many residents and outside observers is that Delhi is gaining a reputation as a city that's unsafe for women with 2,000 rape cases reported in 2014. Other key issues are water availability as many of the city's residents have no access to piped water and electricity. Housing is another major issue as approximately 33% of the city's residents live in informal housing. In East Asia, China's crackdown on corruption and graft continues as the country this week executed Liu Han, a mining billionaire accused of tyrannical crimes and mafia-style killings. Liu Han, who made his fortune in the construction industry as chairman of the Chengdu-based Hanlong Group, was once worth more than $5 billion. He was known for his flamboyant lifestyle, including a penchant for casinos, cigars, and fancy foreign cars. According to Xinhua, China's official news source, Liu Han tyrannized local people and seriously harmed the local economic and social order. 
The government of the People's Republic of China hails the execution as the latest victory in President Xi Jinping's war on corruption, which began approximately two years ago and has shaken up the ruling Communist Party. The anti-corruption campaign has increased the power of Xi Jinping as several big tigers, the president's term for corrupt high-level party officials, have been brought down. However, some analysts say that the crackdown is really a purge of the president's rivals. Questions have been raised about the legality of the anti-corruption campaign and the tactics used to implement it. In a related story, U.S. President Barack Obama invited both Xi Jinping and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe for state visits. Now on to our interview. Today's discussion focuses on the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. ASEAN is made up of 10 member states with a combined population of nearly 600 million, making it one of the largest regional blocs on the planet. The organization was founded in 1967 and has since expanded to include all 10 countries in Southeast Asia. Since its foundation, the organization has worked towards greater integration, mainly through a reduction in trade barriers. ASEAN is currently in the process of forming the Asian Economic Community, or AEC, which aims to turn ASEAN into a region with free movement of goods, services, investment, skilled labor, and a freer flow of capital. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Yun Dosh, Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Department of International Politics and Development Cooperation at the University of Rostock. Dr. Dosh has had uh, appointments at the University of Leeds, Ohio University, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, and several other notable institutions around Southeast Asia. Dr. Dosh conducts re research on international relations in the Asia-Pacific region, political change in Southeast Asia, and development cooperation. A prolific scholar, he is the author or co-author of several books, including The New Global Politics of the Asia-Pacific and The Changing Dynamics of Southeast Asian Politics. It's a real honor to have you here, and um, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. And you just told me before the program that you're working on a new book on uh, Southeast Asian politics as well, and, and ASEAN, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, what we want to talk about today is ASEAN. Um, and um, uh, some of our viewers may have heard of ASEAN or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, but I think many people in the U.S. aren't very familiar with ASEAN and how it works. Um, and how it operates. So could you please tell us a little bit about ASEAN and how it came to be and its role in Southeast Asia today? Yeah, ASEAN doesn't make the headlines very often. Right. Maybe that's a good sign <laughs> uh, because no news is uh, good news. Right. Uh, there are occasions, of course, when ASEAN takes center stage and we will talk about these occasions a bit later, I believe. Um, ASEAN, as you said, already came into existence in 1967, mm -hmm. 47 years ago. Um, it was in August that year that five uh, prominent politicians, foreign ministers of their countries, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Singapore, met at a beach resort um, 60, 70 miles southwest of uh, Bangkok to play golf in the mornings, <laughs> uh, have uh, informal discussions in the afternoon, and then a nice dinner in the evening. Wow. And the fact that these five men actually met in such a casual setting mm -hmm. was rather surprising at the time. Yeah. Um, of course, the Vietnam War was going on in 67, and Indonesia had uh, just stopped its confrontation towards uh, the newly emerging Malaysia, the so-called Confrontasi crisis between 63 and 66. And they were going through a big political transition at the time. Exactly. So, from so Sukarno to Sorrento, right, right. There was yeah. just uh, Indonesia has gone through this, had gone through the, um, to the regime change, mm -hmm. uh, and there was a new Indonesian government. But there were other conflicts in the region too, between Malaysia and the Philippines, about territory, lots of bilateral territorial conflicts at the time, and then the uh, governments of the region were basically not talking to each other. Wow. There was not much interaction going on at the time. They had just achieved their national independence, um, were eager to establish themselves as um, independent nation states in the region and the world, and they were still very much oriented towards their former colonial powers. Sure. So, the fact that these five countries, representatives of these five countries, came together 
to form a regional organization was quite astonishing. Wow. No one would have expected that at that time to happen. Mm -hmm. But there were good reasons to join forces, to strengthen collectively the power of Southeast Asia on the right. international stage. You mentioned already the uh, economic incentives and the fact that ASEAN is now in the process of forming an economic community. And right from the beginning, they stressed um, the economic benefits of regional cooperation. But economic cooperation was not really at the center stage. It was much more about politics, about security. Mm -hmm. There were two reasons, basically, for ASEAN to come into existence, for these five countries to take the initiative to form a regional organization. One was the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. that I already mentioned. Uh, so so the, when, it, when we talk about the Vietnam War, was it, uh, were they afraid of, of the a contagion effect? Exactly, right. that was it. So they thought, uh, individually, they were too weak mm -hmm. uh, to deal with the whole situation in the region. Right. So they thought, collectively, they could increase maybe their voice mm -hmm. in, within the international environment, strengthen their position vis-a-vis -vis the uh, big powers, the superpowers. Um, and so they certainly wanted to avoid a situation that they would become dependent again on a great power. So the formation of ASEAN is not um, like CETO, mm -hmm. the uh, Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. Yeah. It's not, it's not a, they're not a pawn mm. of any of the outside powers. This is more kind of a, a, a almost a grassroots, an upswelling yes, yes. from within yes. ASEAN uh, to orient to one another rather than to orient to the outside. Exactly, yeah. I it was see. never never planned to be and has never moved in, into the direction of a military alliance. Mm -hmm. That was never on the, on the agenda and it wouldn't be feasible. Sure. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the, the other reason, which was more internal, it was also very important, which was Indonesia's integration into the in regional environment. So the new Indo Indonesian government wanted to demonstrate that it would cooperate, that it uh, was not hostile towards its neighbors sure. anymore. And it was also in the interest of, of the other Southeast Asian states to have the opportunity to meet with Indonesian, the Indonesian government on a regular basis, to know what they're up to, and to create more transparency sure, in sure. the region. So, but again, I mean, the, the, um, the idea really was to, to coordinate foreign policies, to, to coordinate um, their individual uh, relations with the great powers mm -hmm. so that they would be able to maneuver the very difficult situation sure. in the region in the late 1960s. Right. Well, that's really interesting. I never thought of that angle before um, about how um, Indonesia kind of had to prove itself. Mm -hmm. But it makes perfect sense because President Sukarno was... Uh, he was combative towards uh, other countries in Southeast Asia, and that was kind of a nation-building strategy yes, for him. And absolutely. Suarto, in order to kind of uh, demonstrate to everyone that the country was safe for an investment, which was a big part of his success mm -hmm. as a leader, um, kind of had to make amends with the other countries. So that's 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 a, that's interesting. That's something I never thought of. Um, now moving on with uh, with ASEAN, when when we think usually about regional cooperation. Um, and integration, the example that comes to mind is the EU, the European Union, uh, with its common currency, uh, open borders in the European Parliament. The EU has pioneered um, uh, the regional bloc. But ASEAN is different from the EU. Mm -hmm. We talked about that before the show. Can you compare and contrast a little bit ASEAN with the EU? Uh, has regional cooperation, is it moving towards an EU model mm -hmm. or is it becoming something distinct and, and, and uniquely Southeast Asian. The um, former Secretary General of uh, ASEAN, Rudolfo Severino, a high-ranking Philippine uh, diplomat, mm -hmm. wrote a very interesting and insightful book on his time in office in right. ASEAN. And one of the first sentences in this book is, Southeast Asia is not Western Europe. <laughs> so, in a way, ASEAN has always haunted, has always been haunted by the EU model. Yeah, there's uh, all these expectations, what so, you're supposed to right, do, right? Right, yeah. So also when you, when you read uh, publications and also media reports, academic publications and media reports on ASEAN, they very often start, uh, start with the, the notion that uh, 
ASEAN is the second most successful regional organization <laughs> in the world, second only to the European All Union. Right. And here you go, you have immediately the comparison. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, um, ASEAN officials have stressed that uh, they did not want to emulate the European Union, that uh, ASEAN was distinctly, distinctly different. And so what are the main differences here? And of course they are right. It would not be realistic for ASEAN to uh, move very rapidly, at least, in, in the direction of um, the European model. Can we but take a, a break just for a moment and come back? Um, first, we're going to take a break here at ThinkTech, um, and we'll be back in just a moment. Yeah. Hi, my name is Andrew Howard. I'm an astronomer at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii up in Manoa. I'd like to tell you about the annual open house that we're having. This year it is on April 6th, 11 to uh, 4 p.m. It's an all-ages event, kids, grown-ups, even uh, people in between, everyone is welcome. We have a lot of uh, really fun activities. You get to meet astronomers, look at yourself in an infrared camera, play with Legos, make robots, look at videos. Um, you can even make it, some of the kids like to make comments out of uh, gravel and and, uh, and snow, even adults like to do that too. You'll be able to look at the sun with a solar camera uh, safely. It's really a great activity. We do this every year um, in April, and I hope uh, to see you this year. Thanks. Okay, welcome back to Think Tech AZ. I'm your host, Keith Bettinger. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, in the studio, we're talking about ASEAN, and my guest is Dr. Yuen Dosh from uh, the University of Rostock. Uh, we were talking just a minute ago about um, uh, comparing EU and ASEAN and how that's not really a fair mm. comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would you, would you like to continue? Yeah. Okay. So the EU, EU uh, always had a, a legalistic approach. That means everything, the whole integration process is based on legally binding agreements, mm -hmm. legally binding treaties. Yep. And they can be enforced because there is a supranational agency, which is the European Commission in Brussels, which makes sure that the member states comply with the agreements and treaties. Um, so that works quite well, as we know. We have uh, difficult moments at, uh, currently, but sure. uh, generally I think the European integration model has been quite successful. ASEAN, uh, on the other hand, is based on convention, what we call informal institutions. That means nothing is really binding. Every country has a veto power. Yep. Um, if they don't want to implement something they have agreed on, no one can force them to do that. So it's consensus kind it's of consensus more oriented. And right. So normally when we think about um, uh, Lee Kuan Yew and the, and the Asian way of doing politics, mm. it's more about consensus and, and like that, yeah? Yes. They have always stressed that. That is the cultural model. Mm -hmm. Consensus, I mean, they take it from the villages of Indonesia right, right, and, right, and, right. and say, well, this is the local culture and this is also how international politics work. Mm -hmm. We sit together, we talk, and then we come to a decision. In the case of ASEAN, that means decisions are made on the basis of the lowest common denominator. Sure. Um, and given the um, development differences, the, the, the diversity in ASEAN, that is sometimes very difficult. Sure. When we think of Singapore as one of the richest nations in the world, and Myanmar or Laos, Cambodia, three of the poorest nations uh, in the world, that's very difficult sometimes to reach consensus. But they have managed quite well over uh, 47 years. Right. And so ASEAN has established a um, different model of regional cooperation, uh, which is an alternative approach, uh, which has been copied by other organizations since then. So we basically have two models in the world. Right. One, is, one, is, one is the uh, more legalistic approach of the European Union, and one is the consensus-oriented soft institution approach of ASEAN. So what's, uh, what's an example of an organization or an entity where this ASEAN model has been applied? APEC, for example. APEC. APEC follows the same model. Mm -hmm. And then we have organizations in other parts of the world, Mercosur, for example. Oh, is that right? In uh, America. Which, uh, which do have on paper legally binding treaties, but which are non-enforceable sure. either. So they work more or less in the same way. Right. Well, that's very, very interesting. Um, so. 
uh, moving on to economics, the big news this year, mm. uh, 2015, is uh, that ASEAN is in the midst of launching the, um, the AEC, or Asian Economic Community. Mm. Now, I know that um, in the past, since I think it was 1992, ASEAN mm. has had a free trade agreement right. amongst the member states. And uh, as, um, as Vietnam and Myanmar have entered uh, ASEAN in the, in the mid-90s, mm. they have entered into that free trade agreement and they have lowered tariffs within the, e, uh, within the I almost said EU, mm. <laughs> they've lowered tariffs um, within ASEAN pretty significantly. Mm. There's some sensitive products still, mm. but tariffs are pretty low. Um, what then is the AEC? What does it mean for ASEAN states? What are the challenges? Mm. So the winners and losers. What what is this thing that we're hearing about? Yes. Since the ASEAN states have been working towards implementing the free trade zone uh, since 1992, uh, we have seen uh, lower tariffs. But overall, this has not resulted in increased uh, trade within the region. Oh. Um, so we have seen slight increases. I mean, intra-ASEAN trade stood at um, 21% in 92. It's now at uh, 26%. So the majority yeah. of what they're doing trade is still outside. That's it. Right. And that is one of the challenges. So on the one hand, you ask, do they actually need a regional free trade area or a regional economic community? Uh, while at the same time, most of their trade and economic interaction that also includes services, that includes investment, mm -hmm. is with uh, 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 countries outside Southeast Asia. China, increasingly, Japan, the United States, the European Union, of course. Right. But there are still advantages for ASEAN to have something like an economic community. Again, although they stress it's going to be a single market, and that's, that's the the tricky issue with terminology. They call it a single market, but it's not going to be a single market in the universal understanding of the term. Right. Uh, but uh, they have done a lot to harmonize their customs regimes. For example, it's, 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 it's much easier now um, um, and much cheaper to ship your container from country A to country B. Mm -hmm. Um, it's easier to, uh, for, for, let's say, Singa companies from Singapore to invest in other countries in Southeast Asia. Um, there are also um, lots of treaties. There's a total of actually a total of more than 350 treaties within ASEAN now. As I said before, oh, ASEAN or within bilateral, ASEAN, bilateral just within ASEAN. Oh, I see. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, also, it's not just on the um, on the economic community because the economic community is embedded in the the bigger project of the ASEAN community, uh, which also has um, two other pillars, which is the political security community and the social cultural community. Mm -hmm. So ASEAN has done a lot of work on the environment. There are still a lot of challenges, but um, they have signed some environmental treaties. They have been working on uh, reducing human trafficking, which is a major challenge, big problem. Yeah. Big problem. Um, labor uh, movements within ASEAN, um, skilled labor is not so difficult. Uh, this is the only part of the whole migration issue in uh, ASEAN that is included in the ASEAN economic community. But uh, the more pressing issue is, of course, um, undocumented labor, sure. uh, illegal migration, and so on. But there are working groups, there are meetings and addressing they're make, all they make, these they're issues. They're making progress on this. They're issue. making progress. They're making slow progress, but they're making progress. There are more than a 1,000 meetings at different levels of uh, the ASEAN organization a year. So. Well, you know, what's interesting about that is one of, the, um, one of the key things that we hear about with ASEAN is this policy of non-interference and mm. mutual non-interference. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a very ASEAN thing to kind of take a laissez-faire attitude to your, towards your neighbors and not critique them. Mm. I think that's an important part of ASEAN. Um, but we may think that it's difficult to handle issues like the environment or human trafficking or, or especially undocumented workers yeah. uh, without explicitly or implicitly critiquing another country's government. But mm. they seem to be able to do that through this consensus approach that they're, that they're, that they're uh, pioneering. Yeah? It's still very difficult. Yeah. And the fact that we have basically all political systems you can think of right, in Southeast right. Asia yeah. for political scientists is a, is a, is a dream. I mean, <laughs> if you want to study political systems, you go to Southeast Asia, you have them all there. Yeah. 
And I mean, you have um, fairly consolidated democracies, I mean, mainly Indonesia, of course, alongside uh, socialist one-party systems in Vietnam and, and Laos, for example. And Myanmar has just started its transition to hopefully a more democratic form of governance. But I mean, given that diversity, I mean, not just in economic terms and the development gaps that exist in ASEAN, but also the level of political diversity. Uh, first of all, it's quite amazing that they have come such a long way For and sure. actually are able to address all these uh, very difficult problems. Mm -hmm. But there are limits to it, of course. Right. And you mentioned non-interference. This has been softened over the past 15, 20 years, uh, um, especially with regard to uh, Myanmar. Sure, that was um, a big issue a couple of years ago. Where ASEAN, yes, the transition. Yeah. Where ASEAN played a constructive role mm -hmm. uh, in supporting the government there in their attempts to move towards uh, democracy, hopefully. Right, 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 right. But um, the, the principles is still there. Um, and it's very difficult to negotiate uh, anything less than non-interference. So it's, uh, but it's 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 not uh, it's not uh, unique to ASEAN. Of course, that's that's one of the core principles of international law. Yeah. Um, so you find similar situations in many other parts, most parts of the world. Um, but they have uh, done good efforts in softening that a bit. Sure. And, um, Realizing really that they are facing problems of regional dimensions. If if you deal with um, avian flu, for example, right. um, environmental disasters, uh, tsunamis, and so on, um, and uh, don't land know fires, borders, haze, right? and so on. Sure. So you have to do it uh, at a regional level. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you you cannot do it within the borders of the nation states. Yeah. Well, the haze um, that you mentioned, that's very interesting to me as an Indonesianist, yeah. uh, because the haze comes from Indonesia, from Sumatra and Borneo. Uh, and that has been a particularly sticky issue mm. uh, over the past few years. Um, so um, our next question then, uh, one of the challenges facing ASEAN has always been inter-regional disparities. Mm. So as you mentioned earlier, there's uh, Singapore, one of the richest countries mm. on the planet. and um, sitting s close to, in the same neighborhood as Laos, which is one of the poorest countries, Myanmar, mm -hmm. which is poor. And then, then we have some middle-income countries that have uh, performed fairly impressively over the past 30 years, uh, uh, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines to a lesser extent, but their growth rate is fairly robust over the past few years, um, uh, especially after the last economic downturn. They seem to be recovering. Um, fairly well. So um, what could greater economic integration mean for the disparity between these countries? So we mentioned earlier uh, that, that there's not a lot of intra-regional trade. And it seems to me that if we think about uh, ASEAN from a world systems perspective, mm. uh, a lot of the countries and, and mainland Southeast Asia supply raw materials to the Chinese market. Um, and uh, in Indonesia has a large manufacturing for export uh, 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 sector, so does the Philippines. And so, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of these economies seem to be geared towards the outside, and maybe they are competing with one another mm. to a certain extent to be a destination for external capital. Uh, and so what, what, what will happen, or what, what might happen to this disparity with increasing mm. economic mm. integration? Yes, to underline this point, really, I mean, you mentioned Singapore and Laos or Myanmar, and uh, Singapore's GDP per capita is 60 times larger than uh, the GDP per capita of Myanmar. Wow. So, it, again, I mean, the last time I'm comparing ASEAN to the EU, but in the EU you have a ratio of 1 to 15 between mm -hmm. Luxembourg and Bulgaria. Sure. That is still a significant gap but nothing compared to ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really difficult for these countries to find some common ground in their strategies. Yeah. And as you have rightly pointed out, they're competing with uh, each other most of the time, so producing very similar products, but at the same time being integrated within the global production networks. Um, and it's actually when we talk about integration in Southeast Asia, what has driven integration is, uh, in addition to efforts by governments to take 
regionalism to the next level. It's the first the Japanese, later the Taiwanese, Chinese, South Korean sure. production networks that have integrated Southeast Asia. Right. Because Can you produce some parts in right there. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, yeah? But we need to take another break. Uh, we'll pick up right there when we come back. Uh, this is Think Tech Asia. Thank you for, uh, for being with us today. We'll be back in just a moment. Ted Ralston, folks, host of our show at Think Tech Hawaii called Where the Road Leads, where we talk about technology influencing the future of Hawaii. Technology, of course, is the art of solving problems. We always bring in interesting and informed guests who can see from different perspectives and different points of view how that future might unfold and how technology can assist us in getting there. So once again, join us 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Fridays. Uh, Ted Ralston, your host. And please, if you have ideas that you'd like us to address on this show or folks who you think should be on it, let us know. Aloha, Yappers. This is your host, Kingsley, for The Yap Show. Every Friday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, you can catch us here live. Think Tech Hawaii, and then later on we upload to our YouTube channel. We talk about youth issues, policies, uh, youth programs, and how to transition yourself into adulthood. Right. But this was like a sign, I guess. Hey, life's <laughs> like, hey, right. now's your chance to go back to school, which uh, I'm doing. Catch us here again live, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Aloha. Okay, so let's pick up um, on, the, on the economic angle. Uh, so you were, you were saying just a few minutes ago, Sophia, we're talking about the global production networks. Right. This is actually where the smaller, weaker economies can benefit because they want to attract investment from, from external sources, mm -hmm. China, Japan, the US, the European Union. And uh, this is where ASEAN can make a difference uh, because it's not just, I mean, the economic community is not just about the single market, it's also about a single production base. Sure. That means, um, ASEAN would be so much more attractive if as a, let's say, German company or US company, I would go to Vietnam, produce there, and then sell to the rest of the ASEAN market. I see. Well, you do that if you don't have tariff barriers, so that would be the free trade area, but what you also need is infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the main challenges that ASEAN faces. Weak infrastructure in many parts of the region. Sure. I mean, we're not talking about Singapore, Malaysia, or Thailand but about Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, the Philippines. And this is uh, an area in which ASEAN is uh, working on really hard. Sure. So they call it the master plan for connectivity. So and, and many projects going on in this area just to, to build roads, bridges, harbors, and, and make sure that the infrastructure improves and that remote areas are, are, uh, get better access to the world and that, of course, you can transport what you have produced in, in one place of the region to other parts and also to the, to the outside world. Sure. And this is done with a lot of Chinese investment, mainly, particularly in mainland Southeast Asia, the greater Mekong sub-region. Right. Um, and and um, uh, huge highways that they're building Highways, in Laos. exactly. Yes, so, yes, but yes. this is really crucial. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that this is really ASEAN's main emphasis at the moment, right. and that's uh, the right approach. So infrastructure is really key. Well, that's interesting, um, uh, an interesting point. So they're moving from being a, um, the, the grand design seems to be to move from being a, a processing center mm. for the rest of the world uh, into being an actual market, a destination themselves. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. We pointed out in, earlier in the program, there's 600 million people. Mm. Uh, living in ASEAN countries, and that's a huge market when you think yes. about it. It's an untapped yeah. market uh, to, to, a, to a large degree. Vietnam, 80 million people more or less. Philippines, 90 million people more or less. It's a huge market. Um, so our last question is about China. You mentioned China, um, and China is kind of the big, the 800-pound uh, the gorilla that people always refer to. Uh, it, there's an interesting dynamic within Southeast Asia with regards to China. Mm -hmm. Uh, some countries are taking major steps to build closer ties to China, Laos mm. and Cambodia. Uh, they're almost economically satellite states at mm. this point to China. Um, while some countries seem to see China as a strategic competitor, Indonesia for example, uh, or even a threat. So how important is this to the integrity of ASEAN mm. uh, as it moves towards greater integration? Could the polarity of China exert some pull in ASEAN, mm. uh, and might it lead to tensions between the member states? First of all, 
China is without any doubt ASEAN's most important economic partner. Mm. The whole ASEAN. The whole ASEAN. Mm. So there is a ASEAN-China free trade area, yes. um, which uh, uh, came into existence in 2010. But there was a kind of pre-free trade agreement before the early, early harvest program. So both China and, and ASEAN have been mm -hmm. benefiting from reduced lower tariffs for some time now. And trade, the trade volume has increased dramatically. Right. It has gone through the roof. It benefits China more than it benefits most of the ASEAN states. So most ASEAN states actually have a trade balance deficit with China. Yeah, it seems like in my own trips to the field, it seems like the presence of Chinese goods has increased pretty significantly over the past yes, five years. Yes, yeah. absolutely. One of the countries that benefits most is Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So they have played it very well. Right, 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 right. But so this is the economic side. And so we already talked about infrastructure development, funded by China. So China is crucial to ASEAN's economic development, further economic development. But then we have other issues which are outside the economic sphere, which are security related yes. and generally politically. And the big issue here is the South China Sea. Sure. Um, as you know, the, uh, China and some ASEAN states, not all of them, compete for sovereignty over parts of the entire South China Sea. Um, and there is no solution inside. It has been going on for several decades already. It's also very important, a very very important issue from the US perspective, of course. Uh, we are talking about the main sea lanes of communication, the trade routes here, which are crucial to Japan and the rest of the China world. China seems basically. increasingly um, uh, willing to flex their muscle Yes. And exert and tr attempt at least to exert influence in, in a larger, a greater body of, uh, of water there in the South China Sea. So um, uh, they definitely to be resolved. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming thank on the show much, today. Uh, that, was, that was really informative. I'm sure that our viewers will get a lot out of that. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I've, I've, I've got an education today. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs> thank you for um, me. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, and um, uh, yeah, that was, that was a nice, nice, uh, nice discussion. Uh, today, as, as per usual, we're going to, um, we're going to uh, 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 move to our weekly cultural corner segment where we highlight some aspect of an Asian culture through performance. This week we're featuring Kakula, a genre of music from the Kalianese ethnicity on the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia. Kakula refers to small and medium-sized gongs arranged in harmony and is commonly played during wedding ceremonies and customary rituals. Kakula is part of the gong culture in Southeast Asia that spreads from the southern Philippines to southern Sumatra. Our clip this week features the University of Hawaii's Kakula Ensemble, which was founded by UH students, including Amin Abdullah, an artist from Palu in central Sulawesi, who earned his master's degree in Asian studies from the University of Hawaii. Amin has been innovative. Uh, he has innovated with Kakula by blending traditional and popular music. I hope you enjoy this clip of the Hawaii Kakula Ensemble, and I want to thank the East West Center and the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at UH, and especially Paul Rausch for their assistance with the Cultural Corner. That's it for this week. We hope you'll join us again next week on Think Tech Asia. Uh, aloha and ahui ho. <laughs>